Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. The thylacine, commonly known as the Tasmanian tiger, was a genus of carnivorous marsupial formerly native to Australia and New Guinea. An incredibly dog-like animal with elongated jaws, digitigrade feet and a short coat of striped sandy coloured fur, the thylacine only became extinct likely during the late 1930s after the last captive specimen died at Hobart Zoo. This was sadly the result of human interference during the colonial period, with the settlement of Tasmania by Europeans beginning in the 19th century bringing with it introduced dogs, diseases and bounty hunters that saw the thylacine as a threat to livestock. The animal was once widespread across mainland Australia, but had died out there approximately 3,000 years ago due to a combination of competition with dingoes, an increase in the Aboriginal population, and a period of extended climate aridification. A relatively small and genetically homogenous lineage persisted on the island of Tasmania, which inhabited the temperate forests present there and hunted small mammals and ground-dwelling birds. The Tasmanian tiger belonged to the genus Thylacinus cynocephalus, meaning dog-headed pouched wolf, and was part of the broader family Thylacinidae. While this Holocene species was a fully terrestrial, jackal-like carnivore about the size of a border collie or Australian cattle dog, the earliest known thylacinids originate from the late Oligocene fossil beds of the famous Riversley site in Queensland, and were much smaller, more generalised animals. Thylacinids were members of the large marsupial clade Dasuromorpha, which contains exclusively insectivorous and carnivorous forms, including, but not limited to, quolls, dunnuts, numbats, and the Tasmanian devil. Phylogenetic studies have confirmed that thylacinids were the most basal members of Dasuromorpha, with their lineage splitting off during the late Eocene. It was once thought that the closest living relative of the thylacine was the Tasmanian devil, although this is no longer considered to be accurate with the actual closest, but still somewhat distant, living relative being the specialised insectivorous numbat. The oldest and most basal members of the family first appear during the late Oligocene at Riversley, with a good example being the genus Badge Sinus. A small carnivore weighing just 2.4 kilograms or 5.2 pounds, Badge Sinus lived in a tropical forest environment and would have resembled modern quolls in appearance and probably lifestyle. It was quite possibly an arboreal animal that hunted lizards, birds, and small mammals in the trees, although the genus is only known from cranial and dental material. Another form known from the early Miocene deposits of Riversley and Bullock Creek in the Northern Territory was Nimbusinus dixoni, dwelling in rainforest conditions between 23 and 16 million years ago. This genus is known from a surprisingly complete specimen only missing the tail and feet. A small predator about the size of a domestic cat, Nimbusinus possessed an unusually strong bite for a thylacinid, which allowed the animal to prey on early bandicoots, lizards, and basal vombatiforms. In addition, the Miocene appears to have been something of a golden age for thylacinids, with a great number of genera inhabiting the same fossil sites and specialising into quoll-like predatory niches. Indeed, these animals predated the emergence of the true quolls in the genus Dasurus, which first appeared at the very end of the Miocene and diversified during the Pliocene. Yet another small genus, this time from the middle Miocene of Bullock Creek, was Mutapurisinus, the tiniest member of the family so far described. Weighing only 1.1 kilograms or 2.4 pounds, this animal was the same size as the modern western quoll, Dasurus jeffreyi, and likely preyed on insects, lizards, frogs, and small mammals. By the end of the Miocene, however, the majority of these diminutive thylacinids had become extinct, most likely due to the continued aridification of the Australian interior. Wet tropical forests were pushed further towards the coasts and remained in northeastern Australia and Papua, while the majority of the continent transitioned towards arid or semi-arid conditions. In order to adapt to these changing environments, thylacinids developed larger body sizes and evolved increasingly terrestrial habits to take advantage of small, ground-dwelling prey. This evolutionary trajectory is similar to that taken by both canids and hyenas in the Northern Hemisphere, which also originated as slender arboreal animals that adapted to more open conditions. The earliest member of the genus Thylacinus appeared in the early Miocene in the form of T. McNessi, 
yet another member of the family from Riversley. This species was much smaller than later members of Thylacinus, weighing less than 10 kilograms, and is only known from a single rear portion of the lower jaw. Like other thylacinids of the time, T. McNessi was probably a quoll-like hunter of small prey. By the late Miocene, however, the genus had begun to diversify and is represented by three species, all of which were larger than T. McNessi. Indeed, two of these were more massive than the historic, familiar Tasmanian tiger. Thylacinus potens was known from a single poorly preserved specimen recovered from a late Miocene locality near Alice Springs. From the little that is known, T. potens appears to have been a heavily built animal, with a shorter and broader skull than its later relatives. Its jaws were more adapted for crushing than those of the more modern T. cynocephalus, with the entire animal being comparable to an Indian wolf in terms of size. Another late Miocene species, T. Magiriani from the Northern Territory, was even larger, weighing up to 57 kilograms or 125 pounds. This animal would have been a stocky pursuit hunter, adapted for stamina rather than speed, and probably targeted macropods and flightless birds. An additional species, T. yorkelius, was native to southern Australia during the Pliocene. A fox-sized animal, yorkelius lived alongside its sister species, Thylacinus cynocephalus, on mainland Australia until the late Pliocene, when it became extinct. This left the modern Tasmanian tiger as the last thylacinid species, which became widespread, although never particularly common, throughout Australia and Papua. T. cynocephalus stood up to 60 centimetres or 24 inches tall at the shoulder, weighed approximately 17 kilograms or 37 pounds on average, and walked on superficially dog-like digitigrade feet. The animal possessed slender narrow jaws with slicing carnassial molars and premolars, the structure of which indicate an entirely carnivorous diet. Overall, the skull showed very strong similarities to those of canids, being particularly convergent to that of a red fox. The structure of the jaws enabled the thylacine to open its mouth at up to 80 degrees, although the animal's bite was surprisingly weak, with the shearing teeth being effective at killing smaller prey such as ground-living birds, bandicoots and macropods. Unlike canids, Thylacines did not possess a strong sense of smell, and instead relied on sight and hearing in order to hunt prey in low light conditions. Later reports demonstrate that the animal was broadly nocturnal or crepuscular, although their actual hunting methods are quite poorly understood. The structure of the limbs indicate that thylacines were not particularly fast runners, but probably relied more on stamina to chase prey after an ambush. Surviving evidence preserved on film demonstrate that the animals walked with a somewhat stiff and rolling gait, with the tail being ramrod straight, much like those of kangaroos. Unusually for marsupials, thylacines possess cartilaginous epipubic bones, in addition to both males and females having pouches. In the case of the former, this was to protect the genitalia while running through the underbrush. Vocalizations apparently included guttural coughs, high-pitched whines and low snuffling sounds used to communicate with others of their kind when hunting and socialising. Some sources suggest that thylacines possess a distinctive, unpleasant odour, while other observers claim that the animal did not have any particular smell at all. Unfortunately, these observations were made almost entirely from captive individuals, so thylacine behaviour in the wild remains rather mysterious. Since the beginning of European settlement on Tasmania at the beginning of the 19th century, these animals were considered to be a threat to livestock and became increasingly hunted, with sizeable bounties being offered for killing thylacines. Common perceptions at the time viewed the animals as vicious, bloodthirsty brutes that fed on the blood of their prey in a vampire-like fashion, views which of course had no basis in reality. In fact, many of the stereotypes associated with wolves in Europe and North America seem to have been applied to thylacines due to their canine-like appearance and were persecuted in a similar manner. This treatment was disastrous for a species that was already relatively rare and genetically limited, with thylacine numbers plummeting across the 19th century. Long depicted in Aboriginal rock art across Australia, the first non-indigenous image of a thylacine accompanied George Harris's scientific description published in 1808. By the early 20th century, 
the increasing availability of cameras led to the first black and white images of the animals. With zoos around the world housing members of the species due to their rarity in the wild, Sadly, despite breeding pairs being sent to institutions in London and Washington DC, thylacines were notoriously difficult to breed in captivity, and no known joeys were produced by these overseas individuals. The last Tasmanian tiger outside Australia died at London Zoo in 1931, with the final specimen known on Tasmania being inhabitant of the Hobart Zoo. This individual, often referred to as Benjamin, was captured on film on several occasions, with a 2011 analysis convincingly demonstrating that the animal was indeed male. This haunting footage is made all the more tragic with the knowledge that this thylacine died due to neglect. He was left outside and lacked shelter during a period of unusually intense weather, dying of exposure. However, it was not realised at the time that this individual may have been the last of his kind. Thylacines were assumed to have remained in the wild, albeit incredibly rare, and were not taken off the Endangered Animals Register until 1980. Many searches have been mounted in the decades following Benjamin's death, but solid evidence has been sorely lacking. Reports of surviving thylacines continue to persist, not only on Tasmania, but rather improbably across the entirety of mainland Australia as well. Due to this, thylacines have become a major cryptid down under, and while I would personally love these animals to still be lurking somewhere in the outback, the evidence as presented thus far is not particularly convincing. However, I am ready to revoke my scepticism if any living individuals or specimens are found. The tragic tale of the thylacine demonstrates the destructive impact that humans can have on the natural world, as well as the danger of viewing animals through inaccurate stereotypes. This species was not a genuine threat to livestock on Tasmania, and was rather shy and reclusive instead of being a bloodthirsty monster. Unfortunately, action was taken too late to save this unique and threatened animal, and this serves as a parable for our management of the environment in modern times. Let's hope that measures can be taken to prevent such a situation from befalling endangered animals today. Thanks for watching everyone. I'd like to thank my patrons for supporting me, including the newest member, Chris Frampton. For early access to ad-free versions of my videos as well as other perks, please feel free to head over to my Patreon page, with the link included in the description. The next episode will cover the Dryopithecines, an extinct lineage of apes that spread out of Africa during the Miocene. See you again soon. Cheerio.